So you want to make an SDK. This is the talk about things that I learned along the way when I created an SDK and published it. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about the SDK itself, but mostly going to focus on some tips and tooling for creating your own SDKs. Um, some of the things in this talk are going to be generic, uh, but a lot of it is going to be focused specifically on Python. My name is Greg Agnizelli. I'm a principal architect and distinguished engineer at Presidio, and I focus on DevOps and infrastructure automation. So the SDK that I made uh, automates Cisco Mobility Express. Uh, in case you aren't familiar with Mobility Express, um, it is a uh, branch solution for small and medium-sized businesses and for distributed enterprises as well. It's good for maybe uh, 50 to 100 access points, um, and it includes all the enterprise-grade features you'd expect uh, from a wireless system, such as support for mobile buses IDs and VLANs and providing a guest portal and, and rogue AP detection and, and things like that. Um, what's nice about it is the access point running the wireless LAN controller function can also serve as clients at the same time. So that can make it a more cost-effective solution for smaller environments or for distributed enterprises. Um, now note this is different than Cisco's wireless controller solution, which is the successor to Mobility Express. Uh, but I made this SDK a few years ago, so I targeted Mobility Express. So the Python module that I created allows you to interact with Cisco Mobility Express uh, in order to retrieve data, make configuration changes, and so on. So you can do things like get information about the clients that are associated, um, get a list and details about the access points that are registered, um, reboot access points, link their LEDs, and so forth. At the bottom of the screen is a link to the, uh, the GitHub repo, which contains all the source code. So here's some basic usage. Here's the way you would use this thing. You would install it with a pip install uh, or you know, use poetry or, or whatever your package manager of choice is. And this little snippet of code here shows an example about how you would connect to a controller. You simply provide the controller's access point, username and a password, and then use like the system information method in order to get some information about um, the deployment. So the screenshot along the right-hand side shows some of the information that would be uh, reported. One of the things I did was to provide some sample code along with the SDK itself. And we'll talk a little bit later about why I think that's important to do when you publish an SDK. Uh, the sample code that I provided, uh, one of them is uh, called Monitor Clients. It continuously pulls the Mobility Express client table and sends a text message to you whenever a previously unseen client has joined. Um, here's another one called WitchAP. It's a simple Flask application, uh, web-based, that shows connectivity info about the client uh, that the app is connected to. So, for example, from your mobile phone, you can, can connect to the application, and you'll see something like on the right-hand side here, where it shows what access point you're connected to, what your signal strength is, and some other information. So that can be helpful for uh, troubleshooting, you know, site survey type of stuff. Uh, and another one that I included was one that just reboots all the access points sequentially. So what it does is it reboots one and then waits for it to come back online before rebooting the next one. So in that way, you could reboot all your access points uh, without causing uh, an outage. So here's a couple of implementation notes just about how I developed uh, the SDK. It programmatically generates uh, these base functions for each API call by basically um, going interrogating the Mobility Express web UI and kind of scraping it and identifying and parsing potential calls from the front end to the back end. Uh, so then it generates this sort of boilerplate. And then I go in and manually create um, methods which front end those to provide some more context and niceties like doc strings and um, type hints, some things we'll talk a little bit about later. And just to note, the project, this project is not affiliated or supported by Cisco Systems in any way. Um, it uses private, undocumented, unsupported web calls. It may not work as you expect. Uh, it may cease to function with a future update of Mobility Express. So let the buyer beware. Okay, so enough about the SDK itself. Uh, here's some tips about writing when publishing your own uh, SDKs or Python modules. So step one, write the SDK. And I say that kind of tongue in cheek because of course that's the hardest part. Um, but, you know, find an opportunity where there's maybe some sort of a system that has a REST-based API where you can provide some value by front-ending it with, you know, a Python-based SDK. Um, simply making an SDK that makes like a one-to-one -one mapping between Python methods and REST API calls, that, that's not incredibly helpful. 
but it's going to provide some level of abstraction to make things easier to use, then that really provides value. Or maybe if the system that you're talking to isn't REST-based uh, and uses some sort of a, uh, you know, an older API or, or more challenging API to work with like SOAP, you know, then again, providing an SDK provides some value. Um, so here is the definition of the method in my um, SDK that blinks the access point lights. And I, I did a couple of things here. Uh, first off, uh, I would recommend that you use Python type hints. So if you're not familiar, uh, type hints are a way of saying what type or types of variable or parameter should be. Um, so for example, if you look here, we're saying MAC address is supposed to be a string and that this whole method returns a dictionary. Now, Python itself doesn't enforce anything based on these type hints. These are all hints that you're providing to the IDE. And then what the IDE can do is, as the user is coding, um, if they try to pass a number instead of a string, let's say the MAC address, the IDE can flag that and say, hey, this is not the right type. Otherwise, the user wouldn't notice there was any kind of a problem until they went to run you know, the, the app and then things crashed. So I think uh, providing type hints um, on an SDK uh, can be extremely helpful. The other thing that you're going to want to use is doc strings. So if you take a look at everything in the triple quotes, um, right after the method definition, uh, this is how uh, a standard way of documenting um, this particular method, what the parameters are, what they do, what type of, um, you know, what type of variable you're expecting, and what is going to return. And again, in this case, the IDE will use this information and provide a little context sensitive help. As soon as the user types, you know, blink AP LED parenthesis, you know, it'll pop up with a nicely formatted doc string. So these are the types of things that can really make uh, using your SDK and adopting it a lot more uh, pleasant for the user. Another big question is what versions of Python are you going to support? This is a little bit, writing an SDK is a little different in this regard than just writing an application or a script. When you're writing an application or a script, you can feel free to say, well, I'm just gonna target the latest version of Python because I wanna use these cool features that are in it. Um, and you're just going to, you know, maybe create a virtual environment or maybe a Docker container, you know, that contains that version of Python. However, with an SDK, your users may be limited to the particular version of Python they're using. Maybe some other framework or uh, library that they're using restricts them to an older version of Python. Maybe the operating system, you know, that they're using um, only supports, uh, it only provides an older version of Python. So typically with an SDK, you're going to want to provide, you know, more backward compatibility in terms of Python versions. So one way you might go about deciding which version to support or which versions to support is based on the published Python uh, end of life table. So if you take a look at that table on the right hand side of the screen, um, here's a snapshot of what that looks like as of right now. So we can see the Python version 3.5, that support ended, uh, you know, 12 months ago and 3.6 support ends in December 2021. Uh, so you could say, uh, if you're running an SDK today, well, maybe I'll support Python's version you know, 3.6 and later. Uh, another potential data point is to look at popular operating systems like Ubuntu 18.04, which doesn't go end of life uh, until uh, April 2023. That includes Python 3.6. So maybe there's another data point to say, all right, well, you know, 3.6 or later. Uh, I would say at this point in time, forget about supporting Python 2.x, which went uh, end of life at the end of last year. So then the other question is what Python, what the operating systems are you going to support? Python is generally pretty uh, operating system agnostic, which is nice, unless you're calling any particular system functions. So there's a whole set of functions that are applicable to a Unix-based system or to uh, a Windows-based system, you know, or, or what have you. Um, but in any event, once you decide which operating systems you're going to support, you're going to want to make sure that you do automated testing of your library under all of those operating systems. So speaking of automating testing, I'm using uh, PyTest to test all the modules provided by the API and perform some level of validation to ensure that each of those methods is returning, um, you know, what's expected. So for example, I'll call the API that, you know, blinks the access point, gets some system information, gets AP information and so on and so forth, and then use PyTest to check to make sure 
that at least some of that being returned, you know, is, is what we expect. Um, this uh, automated testing is uh, extremely helpful because it'll allow you to determine if there's some sort of breakage if you add new features um, or if a new version of whatever it is that you're automating, you know, comes out. You can easily rerun your automated testing uh, and be assured, you know, that everything still functions as expected. So remember how we talked about supporting multiple versions of Python as well. Um, Tox is a tool that will create a virtual environment using um, all the versions of Python that you specify and then run all your automated tests, the ones that I created in, in PyTest, to make sure that everything works against each and every Python version that you say you support. So that is a, a huge time saver, um, you know, in terms of doing that type of testing against all the different versions of Python. So you can see here the way this works is we create a, an INI file that, uh, or a configuration file that Tox consumes. Um, and ENV list just lists all the versions of Python that we say that, uh, that we're going to support. Okay, so once we've done that, then we'll want to publish your module to PyPy. This will make it easy for users to install your module via package manager like PIP or Poetry or, or something like that. The high level steps are, First, create a folder with the name of your package. Then, create an init.py file. And the contents of the init.py file are shown on the right-hand side here. It's going to be things like uh, the author's name, the copyright information, the version of the uh, SDK or module, and then the status, uh, whether it's you know, in development or, or uh, production, what have you. Then, go and create a, uh, an account on pypy.org then upload all your code to a code repo if you haven't already, like GitHub or GitLab. Then we're going to want to create the files uh, that PyPy uses. Um, set up files, configuration file, a license file that explains you know, how your code is licensed. I'm not going to go into all the detail as to how to create those files, but um, when I was doing this, I found uh, this link at the bottom of the slide here to be a really great reference uh, that walks through exactly how to do that. Then once you've done that, you'll create your source distribution by running setup.py um, sdist. And then use a tool called twine, which you can install via pip, in order to publish it to PyPy. So in this case, you'll just do a twine upload dist. And at that point, your package is on PyPy and installable by, installable by anyone. Uh, there's no review process or, or anything like that. Once you've done all the coding, you're, you're not done. You're going to want to provide documentation, of course, so you just know how to use your library. In terms of tooling, um, there's a tool called Sphinx, which was actually created in order to document Python itself. So you've undoubtedly seen documentation already that's been created by Sphinx. And the way that it works is it takes plain text files um, using, uh, that are written in a markup language called restructured text, and then it converts them to you know, whatever uh, output format you want. Uh, HTML, you know, PDF, you know, so on. Um, Sphinx is the tool that I used in order to create the documentation. But if I was doing this today, I would probably take a look at uh, MKDocs. MKDocs, um, similar in function, but it's, uh, it's a little more modern, uh, and it uses markdown syntax for those files that you create, which is you know, a little bit more common than, than restructured text. Then in terms of hosting the documentation, uh, readthedocs.org is a good option. Um, it is uh, free, um, no charge uh, for, for uh, putting that up there. And the way that it works is you create an account, uh, register a project, and then when you uh, and then point it at your Git repo where you published all your code and your documentation. And then you click a button and it pulls the HTML docs out of your, um, out of your code repo and, and hosts them here on Read the Docs for you. Okay, you've published your module, uh, and you've got lots of folks that are using it, but that doesn't mean you're done. Uh, you have some ongoing responsibilities uh, at this point. So, for example, if you host your code on, uh, on GitHub, um, you may automatically get these alerts from a tool called DependBot. DependBot scans your, your code, and it alerts you to security vulnerabilities in some of the various dependencies that you might be using in your, in your code. Um, and you're, it's going to look a little something like this. Um, here's a, a DependBot report uh, that, that came out against, you know, my library a little while after I published it. And it said, okay, these particular, uh, you know, libraries that you're using have security vulnerabilities, you know, you should update them. 
Uh, in a lot of cases, uh, this is pretty easy to remediate. It may be just as simple as bumping the version of the library that you're using, um, and then that will take care of things. So go ahead and do that. Uh, and this is where automated testing really shines, because you can bump the version of you know, the dependency that you're using in your code, rerun your automatic testing, your automated testing, and verify that uh, everything still works, uh, that there's no breakage. If your library becomes popular, you'll have to address issues from users. They may use the issues facility within you know, GitHub or GitLab in order to report things like bugs or feature requests, or maybe they'll even provide pull requests you know, well, there, well, where they'll provide some code that they would like to suggest you know, that you add you know, to your project. So we want to keep up to date on all those. And then finally, um, you know, the system that you are uh, providing the SDK for, as there are new versions of that come out, you're going to want to test to make sure that your SDK is still compatible with that. Or maybe you'll you know, add functionality to um, provide support for new features you know, that they added. So, all right, well, that's it, folks. Uh, now go off and create something awesome. <laughs>